Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to revisit one of my most difficult challenges yet. As you may remember, I completed Pokemon Platinum using only Tackle the entire game. If you haven't checked the video out, I'll leave a link in the description. With the certain strategies and skills I acquired from completing that challenge, I'm going to attempt it again, but on Fire Red. The rules are as follows. I can only use Tackle. Obviously, right? I can't use any items in battle unless they're held items, so no single use items like full restores, revives, full heals, etc. And lastly, no legendary Pokemon, for, you know, a little bit of extra difficulty. So we leave Pallet Town with the Squirtle. Some of you might think that's an interesting decision. Let me explain it. Charmander knows Scratch and not Tackle, which rules it out indefinitely. Blastoise has a higher base attack than Venusaur and is also more useful in battles later in the game. However, all we've got on our minds right now is defeating Blue, and we do so with our newly acquired Squirtle against his newly acquired Bulbasaur. We journey up north and catch a Rattata. Rattata has a decent attack stat and is immediately put to the test against Blue's Bulbasaur once it hits level 10. It does pretty well. So as you all know, the first gym leader is Brock, who uses Rock-type Pokemon. Knowing that we can only use Tackle, I level Rattata to level 20 so that it can evolve into Raticate. This turned out to be really smart on my behalf because Raticate actually does extremely well and we walk out of Pewter City with our first gym badge. The fossil I take at Mount Moon doesn't matter at all because neither of them learn tackle, but I take the Helix fossil anyways. Squirtle evolves into a War Turtle and we emerge at the other end in Cerulean City to battle Blue again. We barely scrape past him this time. As I head up north to Bill's house, I'm faced with the choice of these two hikers. I opt for the one with the single Onyx and not the one with the Machop and the Geodude. There's also another hiker later in the route that has three Geodudes that I really don't want to talk about. For the trainer that can only use Tackle, Hike is the bane of my existence. After receiving our SS ticket, we defeat Misty in the closest of circumstances as War Turtle escapes with one health. Now I know the comments are going to say, look, he has four health. He does not. He has one, and then he levels up. Don't even test me. And we face Blue again. Four of the six important battles in this game up to this point are Blue. We win, we get the HM for cut in order to access the Vermilion City Gym, where I actually solved the puzzle quite quickly this time, I'm not gonna lie. We defeat Left Tackle Surge and head toward the Rock Tunnel. Rock Tunnel is by far my least favourite place in the game at this point. We do not talk about Rock Tunnel. After escaping that nightmare of a cave without Flash, I decide to get the free Eevee in Saladon City. Only problem is it doesn't know Tackle. So, I decide to preemptively buy the Firestone and store Eevee in the daycare. I go to catch a Geodude to add to the team, but it turns out the Geodudes in Rock Tunnel don't know Tackle either. The move reminder is on Two Island, which is accessible after beating Blaine. So, I decide to take the long walk back to Mount Moon and catch a Geodude that actually knows Tackle. We pull out our trusty Versus Seeker and get to work on levelling Geodude up. It eventually becomes a Graveler, and War Turtle also evolves into Blastoise. This guy tells us we can't go through Rock Tunnel unless we have Flash. Little does he know. <laughs> we head to the Rocket Hideout and endure a difficult battle with Giovanni, which we lose. With Erika being too strong for us also, the only option I really have is to go to the Pokemon Tower and defeat Blue again. We do exactly that. I obtain the old rod because I want to add to the team. We spend hours fishing, but we finally get a Magikarp and evolve into Gyarados. With Gyarados, we're able to defeat Giovanni and use the Sylph Scope to visit the Pokemon Tower. The Pokemon Tower is one of the most dreaded places in the game for the Pokemon trainer that can only use Tackle. Every trainer inside uses Ghost-type Pokemon, which we can't actually damage with Tackle. I swerve around masterfully, but some of the battles are just unavoidable. Luckily for us, these Ghastlies are no curse, so they take themselves out. We get the Poke Flute off of Mr. Fuji and catch ourselves a Snorlax. Snorlax joins the club of Pokemon that can learn Tackle, but don't have it for some reason. I get the HM for Surf and catch a lot of Pokemon in the Safari Zone, namely Taurus, which, you guessed it, doesn't know Tackle currently. I try my hand at Koga, but his muck is equipped with Acid Armor and Minimize. It's a very bad situation for us. So, I decide to revisit Erika, and to our surprise, we actually come away with the win. Blue waits for us on the 7th floor of the Sylph Co, and we defeat him as well. We also beat Giovanni, who was annoying, Sabrina, who was fairly easy, and we come back to Fuchsia City with revenge on our mind. We destroy Koga's Pokemon, and continue our rampage on Cinnabar Island, where we defeat Blaine as well. Bill forces us to go on a boat to the Sevi Islands, completely unaware of how much I've finally waited to do this. The Move Man finally welcomes us into his home, and we teach Tauros Tackle. With Tauros, we go to battle Giovanni. Now, a strategy that I used a lot in the initial tackle only run revolved around the ability Intimidate. Basically, to reduce the damage I would take, I would constantly switch between 
Tauros and Gyarados, lowering the base attack of the target Pokemon by 6 stages. This enables us to get past Giovanni's Rhyhorns and win the battle. However, before we take on Blue, I break Eevee out of the daycare, teach a tackle, and evolve it into a Flareon. After a lot of grinding, we finally take on Blue and we get the win. Venusaur knows Synthesis, and it's pretty annoying. We finally get to the Pokemon League, and are greeted in our first battle by Lorelei. The strategy for Lorelei is pretty simple. We're gonna use Tackle. A lot. It does pretty well. And it does so well that we decide to do the same thing against Bruno next battle. Lightning strikes twice, and it works there too. However, here comes the fun part. Agatha. As you're probably aware, Agatha is two Gengar and a Haunter. We can't actually attack these Pokemon. If you remember from earlier, the way we dealt with Ghost Pokemon in the Pokemon Tower was simply by making them curse themselves to fainting. Only Haunter knows curse, however. The only way we're going to defeat the Gengars is if they struggle themselves to fainting. So we go to do exactly that. After getting as many Toxics as possible to land on our already poisoned Blastoise, Gengar finally uses Struggle. And it does exactly one damage to itself. Now, I initially thought it was because of Intimidate, so I tried again. This time, not switching with Tauros so that Gengar's attack would not be lowered. It still barely did any recoil damage to itself. Little did I know, in Generation 4 where I initially did this challenge, they actually changed how the recoil damage of Struggle works. So basically, in Generation 1, the recoil damage would be half the damage done to the target. Although, doing this challenge on the original games would be impossible, as opposing Pokemon don't run out of PP, and Agatha would thus be unbeatable. However, in Generations 2 and 3, the recoil damage is actually a quarter of the damage done to the target. This means that Gengar could possibly knock two or three of my Pokemon out before taking itself out. Keep in mind that there are two Gengars, one has a Citrus Berry, and Agatha has two Forest Stores. Thankfully for us, there is a way around this. I catch a couple Pokemon and visit Professor Oak's aid on Route 11. He gives me an item finder. I use that item finder to grab both leftovers. Now, the leftovers is an item that heals 1 16th of our maximum health at the end of every turn. So keep us alive against Agatha. On our first battle back, with Blastoise and Graveler holding the leftovers, I make the discovery that although Blastoise stays alive, it is still poisoned and doesn't serve much use for us after Gengar is taken out. Blastoise can't be the one that holds the leftovers in this battle. Instead, it has to be Raticade. Here's how the ideal scenario plays out. Firstly, Gengar needs to use Toxic on Blastoise. After that happens, we're going to be constantly switching between Blastoise and Raticade until Gengar uses all of its Toxics, hopefully on Blastoise. If Raticade gets poisoned, the battle is over. Once Blastoise has tanked all 10 Toxics, we start switching between Raticade and Graveler as they both have the leftovers so they can heal off the Struggle damage. Now, Struggle actually hits slightly more than what Raticade heals with leftovers, so I use Tauros' Intimidate to lower Gengar's attack to the point where Raticade will gain health health every turn. If everything works out, Graveler and Raticade will rotate in battle until Gengar struggles itself out. Golbats and Arbok are actually quite easy. The second Gengar, however, has Sludge Bomb instead of Toxic. This is a little bit more dangerous. Again, the name of the game is to make sure Graveler and Raticade aren't poisoned. In fact, it's ideal if Graveler is actually asleep here as it can tank Sludge Bombs and never get poisoned. Gengar eventually struggles itself out and we're left with Haunter. Now initially, I thought Haunter was free because it has Curse. Little did I know it would use Mean Look and completely destroy my team. Mean Look prevents us from switching out. As we can't attack Haunter, it uses Hypnosis and then regains any health that it may have lost through Curse via Dream Eater, putting an end to our hopes and dreams. However, very similar to the strategy that we use against Gengar's Sludge Bomb, I invite Arbok to use Sludge Bomb on all of my Pokemon except for Gyarados, Graveler and Raticade and poison them. That way they won't be able to fall asleep against Haunter and thus make Dream Eater irrelevant. As we slowly take down the second Gengar, I'd like to remind you that these battles took anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes for the off chance that Haunter could still beat us. With Haunter I lead with an Asleep Graveler. The plan is to switch to an Awake Gyarados so that it wastes a Dream Eater. However, it's anyone's guess what Haunter is going to use next turn. I'd switch to a poisoned Pokemon just in case it used Mean Look. If it used Mean Look and the Pokemon was poisoned, the poisoned Pokemon would just erase itself from the battle eventually. After days, Haunter finally uses Curse on itself. And then, it uses it again. Agatha is defeated. If I was to do this battle on Generation 4 games, or anything past it, the difference would be about 400 turns. So, approximately 30 minutes of battle. 
But enough of the nightmare that Agatha is. We still have to beat Lance and Blue. I don't think anyone has ever uttered these words in human history. But Lance's most difficult Pokemon was his Aerodactyl. And then there's Blue. In preparation, I take the leftovers off of Graveler and give it to Blastoise. Blastoise is actually the key to this battle, despite having one of the lowest base attacks on the team. Blastoise is the best punching bag for Gyarados, who poses the second biggest threat to this team. The first is obviously a growth and sunny day boosted Venusaur that likes using Synthesis and Solar Beam. However, with much persistence, we eventually get it done and complete the challenge. Guys, thank you for watching. It's been a pleasure torturing myself on these games for your entertainment. Sorry if my voice sounds a bit weird. I am a bit sick and um, a little bit defeated from the Agatha battle. I'm not going to lie. However, if you want to see more videos like this, there's a couple on the screen that might interest you. I'll see you guys later.